where do these weeks go to? I've no idea. Hello and welcome to this week's show. Post your thoughts and comments as always during the live show below the live stream and my guest will respond to them. And uh, please, please do, and thank you very much for having done this, uh, please do hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening or watching this week's show so you can be notified very gently of a fresh edition each week. Because as I've said before, you don't want stale editions of the show, fresh is best. Jonathan Baker is the consummate entrepreneur. He was a commodities trader on Wall Street, participated many times in the World Poker Tour and Celebrity Poker Showdown. He is co-owner of a chic hotel in New York's Hamptons. He produced the aromatherapy men and women fragrance, Jonathan Baker, EST, 1962, uh, which was a brilliant year for Jonathan Baker's, if you ever know of that's like wines fine wines that was a good year for jonathan baker 1962 he created and sold a very successful spa stayed at hugh hefner's mansion and eventually bought actors warren Beatty and annette benning's home and Beatty became jonathan's mentor jonathan went on to write and direct films produced through his baker entertainment group with its offices located at paramount pictures jonathan baker has two films out at the moment two uh inconceivable which is his directorial debut with a major hollywood film studio which stars nicholas cage uh a guest uh, who was on this show uh, some while back on our podcast gina gershon you may remember her and faye dunaway and the other film is called becoming iconic jonathan baker a very clever and uh cunning documentary which um is both a learning experience for the audience as well as its star as we meet many of the most acclaimed hollywood directors who explain their experiences warts and all um they're talking about making their first film and we'll, we'll get into that as we talk to jonathan jonathan is in our virtual uh, green room and before i bring him onto the show let's watch the all-important trailer for becoming iconic jonathan baker and let's roll the tape listen you don't start a first feature film without having all of those experiences and i envy him i mean because you only do it once after your first film you know you're going to survive or you're not and if you survive you know more but you're never going to be quite as alive and quite as attenuated to every little thing that's happening as when you make your first film it's a terribly exciting experience and at the same time um like i said i, I wish him all the best that's great he seems like he's asking all the right questions um i worked with lots of first-time directors in my life I did Alan Parker's first movie, Adrian Lyons' first movie. They always bring joy to the process, and every experience is different, and how they approach it is always different, but it's always really rewarding to see, um, to see them find themselves in some ways through that process. He's got great enthusiasm, and, and, and he, he reminds me of, of, of myself a bit when I, when I was starting, so I, I, I cannot believe that he won't do well. I'm proud of Inconceivable. More, because of Inconceivable, I get to do Icon, the film that I've been trying to get made for 10 years. And the greatest part about this entire experience is I get to arrive.
What a crescendo. I am pleased to welcome well, Jonathan Baker to this program for the very first time. Hello there. I, you know what? I have chills, you know, watching and listening to that trailer. It just, I, I Jody Foster, Taylor Hackford, Adrian Lyne, John Badham, Warren Beatty, uh, Nicholas Cage, Faye Dunaway. I just, you know, when you, when you cross the lines and everybody speaks and that film comes to that crescendo of really talking about the highlight of that moment, it just, it made me realize why I'm in this business, why I love this business and why I actually did that documentary, which, which everybody said, why are you doing this? And I was just like, you know what, put your heart on your sleeve, bring in the best and have them talk about their own experience, blend the two together and you'll make magic. And it just, it, it's still magical for me. Well, you know, this is a conversation, so I'm going to be asking you some questions. It sounds like I've wound you up already and you're just going to talk. Yeah. That's, that's one, you're the kind of guest I, I knew you were going to be a great guest today and I got so much that I want to still uh, borrow from you, uh, just from your mind. Uh, and I want to start off, Jonathan, uh, you, you don't seem to me to be the type of uh, guy who can ever sit still. So when you go to Post Ranch in Big Sur every January to celebrate your birthday, do you let your brain and your body rest? I mean, do you, because that is, I've looked at the views from there. That is a place where you must be able to unwind. Can you? Only on drugs. Only on drugs. I don't know what else to say. I'm very creative. Whether, I don't drink, so if I smoke some pot, you know, m maybe my creative flows start to go, but I, I hardly ever relax. And that was a joke, obviously. Uh, you know, um, some people are wine people and some people are pot people. I happen to be a pot person. My wife happens to be a wine person, but that's actually how I unwind. And by the way, it's Post Ranch and Esalon Institute on the same day. One is at 11 a.m. in the morning and Post Ranch is at 6 p.m. at night. And Esalon, I've stood on the same place, on the same deck, in the same hot tub since 1980. And I've never missed a birthday. Never. 1980, you were five. So, wow. Oh, that's I that's 17. Yeah, I know. I know how old you were. I'm oh. just being complimentary. By the way, I am an official pot carrying uh, member of the uh, medical uh, world, I, I have a pot card in in my in my wallet, and uh, I, I can sell it. I said I rent it out, you know, by the hour to people. You and I, Jonathan, you and I have, uh, I think, many similar characteristics, other than the fact that you're much wealthier than me. Um, but no, seriously, we have some similar character traits. Uh, and also very similar tastes in films. Citizen Kane and Pulp Fiction are in our respective top five. Yep. Uh, both, as far as I'm concerned, are made by genius filmmakers yep. who know how to tell great stories and also have a flair for cinematic magic. Is yep. that what you like about their, those two films? You know, I've taken the journey of storytelling from the standpoint of does the past equal the future? And if it doesn't in the storyline that you're trying to make, then you fail. But if you are able to take the past and bring it forward so that it does a circular motion and you're actually able to tell a story where you start someplace and you end someplace else and, and what you do with it is magical, it shows up on the screen. I mean, everyone, no one wants to make a bad movie, but there's a lot of bad movies out there, including my movie, which is just an okay movie, it's not brilliant, but the movies that I want to make are much more brilliant than the movies you're allowed to make. And so you have to fight for that. And that's always a constant battle. Yeah, that's something that we're going to get into. And that is a realization that I probably knew was there, but didn't really come to the surface, bubble to the surface until I, I was fuming at the end of uh, of uh, becoming iconic where where you you shared that with us you grew up in new york uh, without a, uh, without a father he left you and your mum when you were i think seven going to watch films was your way of escaping the tough reality of life so is 
is that New York kid? And this is something that when I was thinking about talking to you today, I, I'm often curious about this. Was, is that New York kid, whether he was seven or a few years older, still inside you when you watch films today? Or do you go for yeah. do you get I, I think that that I think that child is frozen uh, who I am as as a human because that's where I was broken. I was broken at seven. So when you break, time stops. You can break at 19. You can break at 20. Some people have a normal life. Their father has a heart attack and dies at 25. They're frozen at 25. I happen to be frozen at seven. Uh, and and what I was doing during that time was experiencing movies and experiencing New York City circa, you know, 1972, 1968. And in that time frame, you know, how you get your information is what you do with it as you become an adult. And so whatever fantasies you have, whether it's putting food on the table, making movies, making music, or just running the streets, at some point you're fueled with a fantasy. And that fantasy is what makes you who you are today at any age. And mm. so for me, I was in New York City and James Bond was my hero. Yeah, James James Bond. James Bond and you came about uh, roughly the same time. Hard to believe uh, hard to believe he's still with us. Not hard to believe you're still with us, but hard to believe he's still with us. Um I and I and there's another question I want to ask because uh uh it, it, I'm curious to hear your answer because I know you attended the University of Southern California to learn about film and while you your first mentor you met uh, soon after, the producer and director Billy Fine, you returned to oh, New York. Oh uh, yeah, oh. <laughs> I know. But the question I want to ask you is: you, about him? He's uh -huh. a crazy one. He's a crazy one. I think they're all crazy ones. I don't know. Billy, Billy was at the top of the category of people that I've met that've been crazy in this world. Good guy, but nuts. Was he really a, a B feature movie maker? Yes, he, he was discovered a Sharon Stone. I didn't know that. Yep. He discovered Sharon Stone. I worked with her while she was a bimbo in a heart tub uh, <laughs> on her first movie. And I was working for Billy um, and I worked for Billy for a couple of years. And it was fueled with cocaine, alcohol uh, to the point where I would come back in the next day and I'd be like, what the hell happened here? Condoms ripped everywhere. I mean, he was nuts. He was married to a woman named Louisa Moritz, who, uh, you know, she was kind of a friend of mine who was like, you've got to meet my ex-husband. And, you know, and then he really liked me. And I, and then uh, the gross organization, which distributed the films, uh, it, it was of a time that B movies were actually you were able to make it and you were able to make it, you know, the way that you wanted to make it. Um, you know, it, it's it's such an I forgot all about that moment in my life. I probably was a year out of school when I when yeah. I met Billy and, um, you know, he taught me the one thing, which is how what I didn't want to be. But I still had fun. Well, didn't he didn't he teach you about the business end of things? He was pre-canon, pre-canon films. He taught me enough of how he was making films that I needed to move over and not make those type of films. I just didn't want to make those type of films, but but I did learn a lot from him and and he was a crazy person and I have to say that, you know, when I bring you bring out his name, I, you know, I put a smile on my face because it's been 30 years since I've thought about him and I've met a lot of people around him during that time that I don't really know today. I think the only person that I know now because of the um the Playboy Mansion that connects to him, which I haven't even reminded him or told him that we were friends at that time, was uh, Leon Isaac Kennedy, who who worked with a director named Jamal Fanaka and created a a boxing character named Too Sweet. And and Leon was married to um, uh, Jane Kennedy. 
And they, this is during his heyday. And since then I became very, very good friends with Leon. Like he came to my weddings. I mean, we are very good friends and I still haven't told him that I know him through Billy Fine. And that's what this is kicking. I'm thinking, I you, might you got to write a down. note. You got to write a note down and tell him I do. <laughs> you, you have, to, but you, you went from Billy Fine and then you pop back east and you, you, you got your license and you had a shot at being a commodities trader. So so that begs the question, one of my favorite expressions, uh, and I, I need to find the, the honest answer to this. Which will drive you to the asylum faster, Wall Street or Hollywood Studios? Or is it a close thing? Well, they're I they're mean, both it, nuts. They're I have both to nuts. Think industry. about it. So so I went back east, um, and I did get my series three, which was for commodities, and then I turned around and and wanted to go and do what Disney was doing with Touchstone, and and move on to the Wall Street floor. It to me, my mother would say to me, forget about producing, forget about going to Hollywood go to Wall Street, learn where the money is, then take the money to Hollywood and own Hollywood like Steve Tisch did with real estate and, and into, into movies. And so I followed that idea for a long time. It's just that I never got lucky enough for that to kind of take me anywhere. Mm. So when I got to New York, I, I, I like working on projects. I don't like going to work. I'd rather work 24 hours a day on something than work 12 hours a day, knowing that I have to get up and repeat the same thing tomorrow. So that's what Wall Street was kind of doing for me. And I had Hugh Hefner kind of, you know, in California saying, what are you doing? Come out and be with me, come out and be with me. So I kind of, after two years, I said, what am I doing here? I, you know, I'm not, I grew up on the East Coast, grew up in New York, went to the Hamptons. My wife loves New York. My life loves everything about the East Coast. And I love everything about the West. I love everything about the, the, what we have out here. And so finally, I just said, you know what? I'm going to go West. And I came out here and, you know, and it was an amazing time. I, you know, yes, I missed Studio 54 because I only got it when I was 17 for a year. And, 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 and the explosion of the Quaaludes and all of that era. But when I got to California and I had the Playboy Mansion, I'm like, this is amazing. And, and, and I had the time of my life with you, Hefner, for I'm, 30 I'm, years from I'm, that date on. I'm sure you did. Before we leave the East Coast, I just want to, I, I feel I'm not touching on anything else, but I'm touching on this. The hotel uh, in the Hamptons, which you and your wife Jenny own, uh, is a stunning look, looking property. I want to put a photo on the screen, if you don't mind. I want people to see this. This is a photo of it at night. Um, the outside or the inside? From what I remember, it's got 19 rooms. It's got, it's, it's got, but anyway. Um, oh, it was, you're right. Yeah, it's 19 rooms. It's got some cottages. It was built, yeah, the was. original hotel was built just before the, the American Civil War. And uh, I'll put a link on my website, folks, to this amazing property. Uh, I, I, want, I want to ask you this, though, for just, I, I have to always throw in a fo photography question because that's part of my life now. Kristen Anderson, who took your wedding photos at the hotel, and I know she was at the birth of one of your children. She's yeah. a gifted oh, artist. Did, did she do any of the shoots for you on the set of Inconceivable? She wanted to. Um, she's a great photographer, but uh, she wasn't really a film photographer. Everything is kind of uh, has its place. And so um, the Maidstone is a pop art gallery for different photographers throughout the year. We start in May and we end in May. So when you look at the outside of the Maidstone, it kind of looks like a small hotel and it's on three acres. But when you go inside, it's rich colors, rich salamander green. It has pop art everywhere and, and, and everything is very well lit. So some of her work does reside in there. Um, she um, has a very unique eye when it comes to horses. Right. If you look at a horse photography um, and and we celebrated her, but not on inconceivable because she you have to have a certain skill set and the studio is. Very yeah, ab absolutely. I just put the photograph of uh, you and your wife, at your wedding 
And uh, that's a beautiful photograph. And um, I never know who that person is. I'm always saying when people get married, they put makeup on. I'm like, who are you? That's not the person that I'm marrying. <laughs> so we have these beautiful pictures. And I'm thinking to myself, why do women do this to themselves? They don't doesn't even look like the same person. But, you know, obviously to them, that that's the but well, mind you, if, if you were key, if you were on the eyeliner and I'm if, always like, why are you doing this? You're going to ruin your skin. You look beautiful when it's not on. And they get used to seeing themselves. And then when they don't have the makeup on, they feel naked. It's a really sad state of affairs that, that, that women have to be like that all the time. And don't get me wrong. I love makeup. Well, I mean, it's it, it, you can look at my heroes. I told you before we started, Keith Richard and Johnny Depp, they wear a little bit of eye makeup. It makes them look better. It may, it's it's really, it's not done for anyone else. It's done for yourself. Everything you know, everything is done for yourself. Um, so I want to move on to your leg the legendary figures who uh, became your mentors and good friends and I think subconsciously or consciously filled the void your father left in your life. Uh, we're talking about Robert Evans, one of the greatest studio executives and film producers uh, of the past generation. Uh, Hugh Hefner and, of course, Warren Beatty. Have they been father figures to you? I made them father's figures. I mean, okay. I, I'm not so sure that they would want that role, but I can tell you Hugh Hefner for sure knew that some of that was going on because that was just my need. And, 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 you know, if you're going to pick a father, you might as well pick people you admire. So all of those people I admired so much. And I would ask questions as if they could have been my father, but really at the end of the day, they loved that I gave them the attention that they deserved. And I asked the questions that were really important to them as people. And I certainly got a lot of information from the most successful, the most powerful and the most interesting people I know in this lifetime. And of course I've taken it with me into who I am today and I'm over yeah. 50 years old. So, um, it's just, it, 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 it amazes me that, that, that who you are at 20 and 30 and 40 has nothing to do with life because who you are at 40, 50 and 60 is the culmination of everything that you gain from everybody in your life. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, couldn't agree with you more. I wish it was the other way around. I wish life was in reverse. The, the the documentary becoming iconic, which I absolutely loved, and and will be telling everyone how they can watch it, and they and they have to watch it, but they have to watch it in tandem with your other film. It was directed by Neil uh, Thibodeau, and uh, it was a way for you to learn about filmmaking from some great film directors, while also sharing the experience. Uh, with us watching it and uh, showing us how you dealt with so much more than um, than directing on the set of uh, Inconceivable, which uh, w becoming iconic was showing you, uh, showing us your learning curve that you would take to Inconceivable. Warren Beatty told you that making a movie is not democracy. Did he mean by that? Uh, you that gave me chills. Well, did, did he mean that it was a dictatorship? Because we sort of yes, discovered in this film, Becoming Iconic, that dealing with a big studio was a dictatorship. Is that what he meant? So we started Becoming Iconic. Remember, Neil directed me, and I was asking the questions to the famous directors, Taylor Hackford, Jodie Foster, uh, John Badham, Nicolas Cage, Faye Dunaway. I was the interviewer and and Neil was basically trying to capture my past. When we came to Warren Beatty, that statement that you just made is probably the whole pivoting point of my life as a filmmaker and the probably the movie's point in that what he was saying was not that it's a dictatorship from the studio. He was saying, listen, there's only one boss. Everybody works for you. And the moment that you think that this is a democratic place, you are going to fail. By the way, Taylor Hackford said the same thing. He said the moment that you allow them to make decisions 
for you decisions in a split second, you, you will lose the entire journey of telling the story that is in your head. So for me, it's always, hey, what is your vision? What is your story? What is your character arc? What is your story arc? And by the way, Robert Redford is a director who I'd love to have had on that documentary who's busy, you know, taught me more about that character turn than anybody. And he's one of my movie stars, like down into the core of who I grew up with. So, so at the end of the day, whether Warren is saying it's a dictatorship or whether, uh, um, Robert Redford is actually talking about the character arc and the story arc of the journey you're taking. You, as a filmmaker, you must hold true to a vision. If you don't have a vision, you have no right making a movie. You cannot make it experimental. You cannot find yourself. What's on the page is what's on the screen. That's what Robert Evans taught me. He right. says, that's it. And so I stuck with that. And all of these people had certain golden rules that they believed were at the core of who they were. And I honored each and every one of them to the point where I had a question myself and I had to blend who I think I am as a filmmaker in what I learned and take for not take for granted what they were saying to me and what search and goal I was to be a better filmmaker and to be a good filmmaker. And now I just haven't made enough films to actually demonstrate that. But I actually know that on the journey, what they've given me is invaluable and amazing. And it always gives me chills to talk about it. So if I use my analogy, which I like to use about making a cake or making a stew or whatever you're doing, you have the initial ingredients what makes what makes your dish a signature dish but now you are stirring in some of the special ingredients that you learned from them and and melding it into your own pot so that you've got your own initial grounding there your own initial uh beliefs and and motivation but you're also remembering what they told you and you're you're putting it all together right i mean that basically is I what mean, you do. yeah but it's the reverse of that i'm using what they are saying is their own foundation and their own journey and then i'm trying to find who i am and what my journey is and my vision is and weave it through what i believe are some golden rules that they have taught me of course all of the people that are superstars, iconic. That's why the film is called Becoming Iconic. Not because I'm iconic, because they're iconic and I'm standing next to them and I have the chance to be iconic. Yes, that, uh, that is a subtle difference. And, and, and I think it becomes evident uh, when you first see the title, you think uh, maybe it's an ego trip. But when you watch the film, it's anything but. You realize that what you're striving for is to to be iconic or to be as respected as they are in in their craft are there any skills that you learned in poker because i know you're a good poker player <laughs> that you have applied to working in the oh, film industry you are funny you just throw him at me and i'm just laughing inside i'm telling you you're one of the funniest interviews i've ever done because you, you evoke things that are interesting that I actually like about myself. So yes, I played poker for a very long time. Uh, before the poker craze, uh, Vince Van Patten and Dick Van Patten, both of them very good friends of mine, they were my family on the, on the West Coast, taught me how to play poker. While Vincent was getting ready to go to school and he, it was at, at the end of a night, it was two in the morning, he goes, I gotta go and he'd have all this cash and, he, and, and we'd be going, where are you going with our money? He goes, I gotta go to school. And, and that's a true story, right? So he taught me everything. And Dick Van Patten taught me how to play seven card stud. And so I made a lot of money from probably 1984, when I just got back from Wall Street, all the way through probably to 1996, when poker started to show you their, if their, their undercards. And I learned how to read people. I learned what the skill set was that that constituted a tell and, and, and I loved the game for years and years and years. I mean, I don't play it much anymore because I think everybody got too good. There was a time that I 
go to Vegas, could sit at any table, and I would never lose. And and I would say never. I mean, of course, you're going to lose sometimes. But 80% of the time, 90% of the time, I, I, I would win. And so I would come with my girlfriends. I would come with my, with, with my best friends. And they would all kind of go off and gamble and do, you know, uh, blackjack and craps. And they would come back, and I had wiped out the table. And, <laughs> and it was – it was pretty astonishing taking that into into the real world of reality television or into uh the world of hollywood mm, you, you learn really quickly who 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 is a bullshitter and who is not i learned from a book once called neuro linguistic techniques it's a real book and it's a real it, it's a study that i used playing poker that talks about where the eyes go whether you're connecting into memory, visual, or sensitivity, when you look and when you speak. I'm telling you, I, I read this book, it changed my life. I, I, I never not bring it with me, and I brought it forward to the movie business because there's so many strange characters in the movie industry. Everyone tells you what you wanna hear, everybody tells you what they're gonna do, everyone tells you what's happening, and then you have a corporate shell that comes in and says, no, no, no. So I had to be able to um, defend myself uh, intellectually and defend myself, you know, in order to protect the, the, the entity, which is the film or the story that you want to tell. That's why when you watch all types of directors and, and writers, they have some animosity towards the film industry or towards agents or towards studios because they're always like, hey, you have the, 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 the creative over here and the business over here. And I'd like to say that a lot of it is filmmaking, and then when you're not filmmaking, you're in show business. So you have to know what hat you're talking to, what yeah. conversation you're having, and if you don't, you lose. And if you do, you can thread it back and forth and know who you're talking to and what you need to get from that person as you're kind of maneuvering down the film industry. And so poker allows you to see and have clarity if you're a good poker player. It's actually that's that's what I was really getting at, and I and I um, uh, I was I mean I know the the film industry and so many industries are, are, are notorious for having a lot of people that are smiling at you, putting their arms around you, and then putting a knife in your back. I experienced that in my previous life in in, in the wine world. I experienced that. I want to talk about. Uh, I did it. What? Sorry, my ex-wife. Yeah. Um, Taylor Hackford uh, is everyone, if they're not, uh, and by the way, hi, yeah, Rabina. You're, you're, nobody, I know we've got people watching but not saying hi. Hi, Rabina. I hope things in Scotland are, are, are good for you. Uh, Taylor Hackford is the film director known for so many amazing films, but for me, an officer and a gentleman is the one that sticks out. I want to show a clip now uh, from Becoming Iconic, which is showing our guest Jonathan here uh, directing a scene from his film while uh, Taylor Hackford, you can hear his voice, the voiceover, talking about his own first time experience. I, I love this clip. It's a short clip. So we're going to uh, uh, roll the tape right this second. If I only knew then what I know now, it would be a better film. Because when you start, you know zip. When you finish, you've learned, you've had the test of fire, and you know. And you think back, God, if I'd only gone, you know, if I first day I had all this knowledge, not the way it works. The first film is a complete learning process. And for people who come in and said, man, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I drew every every image that I was going to shoot. I didn't know what I was going to do. You go into it and you're now faced with that kind of pressure. It was the moment that I became a director. I don't know anybody that can do 13 pages in a day. Do I want to do 13 pages in a day going forward? No. But I've been schooled. Wow. You just keep sending them. I'm telling you, I got more chills in this interview than I have since my kid was born. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I I hate to be a bore, but I'm you know I'm learning photography, and I'm bring and I'm and and I think about what I 
I'm learning and I'm 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 looking at a lot of what you were discovering and a lot makes sense. So one thing I've learned is you take a burst of shots because even though you think the first photograph, if you're working with a model or if you're working on a, a macro photo with an insect, if you think that first one is good, you take a bunch of them because it's probably not good. But as you go along, they get better. And I can relate that to exactly what he said about making the film there. And I think that was a very, a very profound statement and a very clever statement. And you can only make that statement with hindsight when you're a great director. So, uh, but I, I tell you what I do want to ask you, and this goes back to something we were talking about before. And this, this really bothered me. This is a statement that really bothered me. And I don't know how the hell you heard this and could continue. Uh, mm -hmm. one, of, one of the great directors, uh, fellow countryman of mine, Jonathan Lyne, told you that you have to work in the movie business from a position of paranoia. <laughs> I mean, if that's true, how on earth do you even put your one foot in front of the other? So, well, first of all, what Taylor was saying was that you don't know anything. And I want to put this out there to the audience that when I would go to the agencies, ICM, CAA, UTA, that would be the question that they would be asking me, which was, can you direct? And I had no idea. That's how this whole project started to begin with. I went back to Warren. I'm like, what are they talking about? I went to film school. I put, I know how to tell a story. I've written scripts. That's not what they're telling you. It's code word for can you handle the pressure cooker? So when you actually make a movie, the moment that they say you're greenlit to the moment that you deliver the film, your life has changed. It's like someone stuck a hot poker up your ass and literally electrified you for eight to 12 months of your life and it doesn't stop. It never stops. Nothing ever gets turns off. So as you learn the process of making films, when you get to what Taylor Hotford said, what he's saying is at the end of the day, you're now you know what is expected from you and whether you can handle it. There's many people that get on the set and run away, that implode, that cry like a baby in the corner, cannot make a hundred decisions in a split second. And at the end of the day, they make a bad movie because they then turn the power over to all your department heads back to what, to what was said about Warren Beatty being, not being a democracy. If you're scared, it becomes a democracy. And if one person makes a mistake, the dominoes go down. So that's what, that's what Taylor Hackford was really saying. And that's what he was teaching me. And that's what Warren was saying in his same conversation, because it doesn't sound politically correct, but when you actually know that you're the creator of the journey, it is politically correct. So when Adrian Lyne, who did Fatal Attraction uh, and did The Runaways and 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 you know he came to me and he said you have to work from paranoia. I'm already working from paranoia. I'm working from paranoia from the point that I want to get my vision heard, done, and I and 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 if I listen to other people, then I'm gonna make a bad movie because they 90% of the time, words spoken are different than the actions done. I can tell you to be a great filmmaker, but if you don't know how to be a good filmmaker, <clears throat> it, it, the work speaks for itself. And sometimes you don't even achieve what you believe is greatness in yourself because everybody has something to say. Their hand is in your pocket. When you're successful, you are nailed to the stake when, when you fail. So, and that is that that's what the director really is today. And yesterday, it was your Hemingway. You were the writer. You were the dictator of the story. <clears throat> and and in the Hemingways of the world told the stories. Today, it's not like that. The producers are telling you what they think they want and hope that you're able to give them enough credit as you are producing your vision. And so mm, with somebody like me, if you're a first time director, what happens is that most people succumb to it and say, this is my first time. I'll just do what they're asking me to do and I'll just get through my days. And hopefully that's great. With me, it was completely the opposite. I held to the vision. 
I held to what I was taught by my graduate class of becoming iconic and 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 I held really firm and it created a lot of tension and a lot of friction. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> like Francis Ford Coppola said to me, Jonathan, they hated me, hated everything I did, everything, no matter what movie I was on. But the moment that it showed up on the screen, they loved me. Mm -hmm. They celebrated me. I never knew if they were honest, if they were real or if they weren't. So why do you do this? And this is the answer to your question, because you're in love with the journey, because you love every aspect of being creative, writing, producing, directing, <clears throat> everything comes with its inherent, <coughs> excuse me, with its inherent journey to be the best, to be the most interesting. And if you're not doing it for those reasons, I don't know, maybe you don't make a great movie. You should, you should, uh, you should find another another job. Here, would you like some of this? I got some sure. some nice water sure. here. Would you like? I'm looking, I'm looking around, thinking, you know, what type of a moron doesn't bring water into an interview? <laughs> I well, I, I just want to uh, mention I've uh, I have a friend of the show who who uh, who's been following me for years and years and years. And Candy, hi, I love you. You know that. Uh, you, Candy asked me, how do you handle all the different personalities of the actors and people on the show? Well, Candy, here's a perfect example uh, of the greatest type of guest that I could ever wish for. Uh, a show is only as good as the guests you have on it. And if they're engaging, as Jonathan Baker is here, uh, then this is a dream come true. And I'm having a ball today and learning a lot. And, and, I, and also, Jonathan, I hope you don't mind, but I've been going to full screen. I'm going to do that now. And I'm showing people you in your movie theater because I love that view. And I want to point out to everyone that above Jonathan, to, to our left, to his right, is a photograph of Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty from uh, the film that turned their careers around called Bonnie and Clyde. And the reason that is there is because Warren Beatty, if you missed the beginning of the show, has been a great mentor and friend of our guest. And Faye Dunaway is one of the stars of his uh, current film. So his life has come full circle from being in the audience to being on the screen, it's like a Woody Allen film where you walk right. onto the screen. But anyway, I, I, I don't want to get carried away. I, I had a few other thoughts about you I wanted to share with you. Hugh Hefner was the brand as far as I'm concerned, not Playboy. Hugh Hefner was the brand. Absolutely. Tarantino is the brand, not yep. his films. At the end of the day, Jonathan Baker is the brand. And, and that is the key to your passion and your drive. Would you agree with me or disagree with me? 100% agree with you. And, and you know what? Uh, um, I believe that the brand speaks for the quality that you put out into the world, whether it's the house or whether it's the product, whether it's the hotel or whether it's telling a story. People recognize what you're going to give them and enhance them by what you're giving to them. And that's why I love the brand. Jonathan Baker is a third person to me. In 1962, I just is a kind of a joke because it established 1962. That's when I, the year I was born. But more important, all the people that go to the next level in their life, whether it's Coppola and he does his wines, or whether it's Hefner and, and he created the world of Playboy, or whether it's Arville Redenbacher, who did popcorn, or whether it's Dyson, who did vacuum cleaners. One thing in common, everybody loves the journey they're trying to share with the world. Well, I just put uh, Jonathan Baker, established, or EST, 1962 on the screen, uh, the three items there, and uh, uh, it's... Uh, it's it's a beautiful looking uh, it's it's beautiful looking line range of uh, uh, aromatherapy and uh, uh, I love that your motto I I've, I've got to move myself along because I ramble and I don't want to ramble with somebody like you I can ramble uh, your motto is life by design and as I understand it again I think I understand everything I glean from this film and my research of you your motto is life by design and as I understand it your life 
was redesigned by you, rebooted, and you reimagined the life you were dealt as a child, or the hand, if you want to use poker terms, the hand you were dealt as a child. So you re calibrated your life that's your life by design is that design now fully complete or have you still got some work to do on that design so life is by design uh i follow that rule because i understand that everything is a secular cycle everything from five years or seven years creates your future good or bad if you are innately good you will find yourself in innately good situations if you're innately bad you'll find yourself in a bad situation but more important what you do with your journey and what you live by whatever that is whatever passion whatever love of life whether it's women whether it's cars whether it's adventure whether it 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 has to be something you have to be in love with something in order to be successful and that's why i wanted to really just put out there that life is by design and i put it out there to such a degree that i actually bought a crypt and my name is on it and it says jonathan baker 1962 to present uh stay tuned Stay tuned. I, I like I like that part. Stay tuned. I'm never going to change it because I get to be immortal for the rest of my life because anybody who sees it where it is above Hugh Hefner's and next to Marilyn Monroe and anybody who sees it thinks what is really going on here. But the eccentricness of life is by design and and you get to encapsulate yourself in that design is why I did it, because it's just an interesting twist on something that's maybe a little macabre but still very interesting so uh, i i would have just changed maybe the ending i would have um my, because of my sense of humor i i i would have just said watch this space you know just have people <laughs> standing around waiting for them to bring you out uh my, my brother has joined us um and um um, you, you might want his services one day. He is one of the world's leading, and I say the world's leading, um, forensic accountants. And uh, he's, he's, uh, uh, we, I should have stood up and played the national anthem when my brother joined us. Anyway, my brother's Howard Silverstone. He says, do we have to continually redesign? So he, he's, he's continuing that question and asking if, if in life we have to keep redesigning and, and, and reimagining ourselves. What do you think? I believe that you don't reimagine, you keep walking to the end. The end of what is life is by design is one path that you have to walk down. You can make tweaks to get there. And if you continually change your path, and some people need to do that because they're not on the right path, then yes, you have to change. But for the for the most part, the most for the way to become successful, the way to have a great life, the way to answer the question, are you happy, is to follow the journey to the end. But you have to imagine what the end looks like. So in answer to your question, have I gotten to the end and is life by design completed? Um, I have three things left on my bucket list, three. I have completed everything I ever wanted to do except have a boy, which I'm still trying to do. I have three girls, um, which is to complete Icon, which I have not completed, um, and to finish the film that I'm working on now, which is Fate. Once that is done, um, I'm actually confused myself of what my life will consist of. I'm 58 years old. Um, I have no idea if let's just say I complete everything in the next five years. Um, I have no idea what my seventies would actually bring me. But at that point, in answer to your brother, I would then try to imagine what the last part of my life would be and how I would encapsulate that, um, in order to have something to look forward to. D does your wife, uh, does your wife know that you're trying to have a boy? Oh yeah. Have you told her that? Oh yeah, I've uh, she, up, she's I've with she's her with. head. I've sent her to in vitro. I've tried everything you can imagine to try. I've spun. I've spun for the boy. 
I don't know what the. Well, I mean, did. I was going to ask you. Your wife is with you when you're trying for the boy, and not on your own. But anyway, maybe I shouldn't go no, there. That was I've just... been on my own too at times. <laughs> So, um, and the other thing I've got to ask you, I've got to ask you this because because this 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 is uh, this is 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 quite uh, uh, incredible to me about life imitating art. So I'm showing you there in your movie theater in your house on the west coast. When you first got the keys to the house and started walking around this house, knowing that that your your hero and now your friend and your mentor. Um, uh, and um, had had owned this house for uh, Warren Beatty had owned this house for I can't remember now how many years a good number of years. Do do you walk around feel getting a sense of Warren Beatty being a presence in your home? I used to. Did you before I before I ripped it down to to d down everything down to zero and built it all back up again. So so. When I first walked into this house, I had looked at 150 different houses all through Los Angeles, and I hated everything I went into. Whether it was the top of the line or the bottom of the line, it didn't make a difference where I was, what I was doing, you know. And I was like, if I can't believe that these people can't make a house, and I'm like, I'll just do it myself. I'll just do it myself. So I started looking at different through a different lens, right? If I couldn't, if I couldn't buy it, then I was going to do it myself. And that's the true sign of a creator. And so, um, I was allowed to come into this house after 150 houses and I walked through the front door and it wasn't with Warren at that time. It was with his broker. And, um, I walked in, I took one look at the hallway I looked at the dated house because it's 22 years old. Nothing's ever been changed in 22 years. I walked through it. I came back to the front foyer and I looked at the broker and said, I'll take it. Oh, Sight yeah. unseen. Yeah. I don't care what it is. And the broker looked at me like, what? I'm like, it doesn't matter. I love this place. And so he said, okay. I got a call from Warren the next day saying, I'm not selling and I'm taking it off the market. I was too eager. I, you know, he was like, uh, what, what happened? Maybe I, maybe he was making a mistake. So he then decided for, I don't know, three or four weeks to send in his crews and talk about updating it. And, you know, he, the good thing, thing about Warren is that he knows everything and he's right all the time. I'm right all the time, but he's really right all the time. I mean, this guy, he told me what it would cost, how much it would be. He took me to his present house, put me in his basement, showed me all of these models, and he had such knowledge. And <clears throat> by the way, I was wrong. He was right because this project was double what I thought it was going to be, and he was right there down to the millimeter. Anyway, he decided at the end of the day that – he didn't really want to spend that five years redoing his house because he wasn't going to live there and he had just done it to his other house. So he basically said, I'm just going to tack on a quarter of a million dollars and take it or leave it. And I still looked at him and said, I'll take it. And, and then he called me a month later after the deal had closed and he said, I've never sold anything in my life. I can't believe I sold you that. I can't believe how much money you made in the last three months. I can't believe it. I mean, because the market had turned literally three months later and, and, and I had almost doubled the investment and, you know, so he wasn't too happy about that. What, what, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, I, I do want to ask you this question cause we're coming up on the hour. You got another 10 minutes for me? Cause I'm really loving this chat. Of course you do. Huh? You do? Okay, good. Um, all right, stick around folks. Cause we do have another trailer to show from another film. Uh, I, I just want to ask you what it is about you. I don't know if you have an answer to, to this that struck a chord with Warren Beatty. Has he ever told you? Because he, he really he really took to you and has, has I mean, he's responsible in many ways uh, for for the film that you're that we're going to be showing the trailer to in a minute. Inconceivable. Uh, he helped put a few things together in that. I know. What, what did he see in you? Well, first of all, I love the question. First of all, I think he thought I was really entertaining. Huh. Second of all, I think he's really thought that I was respectful in the areas that that he appreciated. And 
And last, um, when we went in there, I made it a point not to talk about real estate because I really didn't care about his house. I cared about making movies and I wanted him to tell me how he made movies. And I spent a good deal of time talking to him about how he does what he does and how I could actually understand what his process was. And once I understood it, you know, I, I think he appreciated the fact that I, I really wasn't there just to paw on him, that I was really there to take everything that I possibly could and reinvent myself with his knowledge because he is old Hollywood. And when we when we consummated this this house deal, the L.A. Times wrote a a great article and I should send it to you about passing the torch from old Hollywood to new Hollywood and oh. wrote an, an entire article about who he was in his time. And at that point, he was 78 years old. Right. So he's like got to be 84, 85 right now. Yeah. 85. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And um, and so he read this article from New York Times and he called me up and he went, boy, you're something. You're something else. <laughs> I mean, so I think I entertained him at the end of the day. <laughs> um, I, you know what I'm going to do? I've decided that uh, I'm going to show the trailer after our conversation at the end of the show because that way people will see the trailer and then they'll go online and they'll and they'll order it and watch it because because it's a fabulous trailer. Uh, what I what I want to ask you is we're we're talking about. Um, becoming iconic and and then we're talking about of course uh we're talking about the film that that's sort of running concurrent with which is called Con inconceivable it's it's about the making of inconceivable and the thing that horrified me and it's to me this is the most unprofessional uh, uh pathetically amateur uh uh position that anyone could take and this isn't you or the cast. This is what you experienced. I, and I was wondering whether it, it shattered your confidence because it's the worst thing you can do. You in uh, Becoming Iconic share with us. We see that uh, while you were making this film, in the very early stages of making this film, there were representatives from the production company standing there, breathing down your neck. There were representatives from the Bond company and the studio watching over you. They even had a bloody replacement director on hand. What a slap in the face if you should screw up in any way. And, and the cast of actors, and these are great actors, we're including Nicolas Cage, Gina Gershon, uh, Faye Dunaway, are aware of this. Plus, they're throwing at you 13 pages of script that you have to go through in a day which nobody has to go through. It's almost as if they wanted to break you and have you walk away. How, how did you not have your confidence shattered? I mean, I compliment you and commend you for coming through on that. How dare they? That's, you, you can tell how angry that made me watching that in the film. So <laughs> they did break me. I mean, you can see me crying and, you know, in the middle of the film, but the love for the journey and never giving up and the tenacious behavior to do the best that you can do <clears throat> under any circumstance is what I wanted the audience to take away. So yes, um, they at that moment were only interested in content. Um, they were not interested in the experience or the film itself. The actors had no idea what was going on. Just so you know, it, it, they, they didn't know. They oh, had no good, idea. good. So, I didn't know so, that. Good, um, good. They just saw a lot of people from the movie studio, from the production company, from the bond company. And, and, you know, mm, I, I, they made me doubt myself and I did doubt myself, but there was nothing I could do except stick and move, make a decision, live with it move on and hopefully that the actors are well prepared about 12 hours before inconceivable was to shoot um there was supposed to be a cast dinner and i asked to cancel it and the production company 
had a meltdown. Mm. They didn't, they wanted the cast. They wanted everybody. And I was like, look, you, you guys have me pressed against the wall and I, and I have to deliver. I need a table read. Nobody does table reads anymore, but I can tell you it's that table read where I let them all come at the table and I said, don't ask me to change it on the set, change it right now. If you've got something to say, I wanna hear about it. We're gonna say yes or no right here. And when we get to the set, we can then move. And so there's no ideas when we get on the set, there's only action. And you guys have to encompass your character and your development and your arc right now as we do this reading. We spent, mm, I don't know, six hours doing this table read, which was not a table read. It was a table correction of the script so that the actors could have what they needed to come in and, and do a good job. I will tell you that it's the single reason why Inconceivable does not fail. Inconceivable should have failed given that pressure and given the fact that all of that yeah. was going on at the time. And, you know, it's not without its own problems and or its fault. Inconceivable is not the greatest film on the planet, but it's a great popcorn movie. It's a great popcorn movie for women. It has a unique through line that, uh, that we've not seen at all. And still today we don't see. And so, and, and I love the ending. I took the ending and made it a beautiful crescendo, which, you know, when you see it, you'll, you'll, you'll feel that there is a, there's a payoff that, that is not typical. And, and this movie should have had a typical ending. Yeah. Uh, I, and what I what I got from um, becoming iconic um, from 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 your two uh, most most admired, respected and legendary uh, uh, cast members um, is is their generosity and their kindness to you. And that's Faye Dunaway and Nicolas Cage. And I've done a little bit of editing from some material that I received and I would like people to hear the compliments on your work uh, mm. from Faye Dunaway and Nicolas Cage. So let's uh, roll the tape on that. It's just a short video, folks. How many first-time directors have you worked with? Oh, I don't know, three or four, five, maybe ten. <laughs> Are there certain hurdles that you always have to face when you're dealing with somebody who's, who's out for the first time? You know, yeah. Um, they... Um, they're interested, uh, you know, they sometimes get daunted by your work and, and other times they, they're really interested just in working with you because they like your work so much or, you know, they're, they, most of the times they're very interesting though because they're innovative and they're looking to do something new. That's true of Jonathan, I mean, I find him very impressive. Jonathan is very enthusiastic, he's, he's extremely excited about the material, he cares so much he's a very sincere filmmaker i just love nicholas cage's voice you know it's what a, he's got such an incredible voice you know what i'd like to do jonathan i'd like to if you don't mind um just give people a, an idea because we're going to wrap this up but you're going to come back because we've got so much more to talk about we've got to talk about um inconceivable so uh, you've got to come back and talk about that and i know you've got so much other stuff in the pipeline i've been on your website but before i show the trailer at the end of the show for inconceivable and and just a reminder ladies and gentlemen there's two films that we've been touching on today the first one is becoming iconic jonathan baker which is where jonathan learns from some of the great directors how to be a first-time director and we see as a fly on the wall, we see him learning from these people. And we also see it juxtaposed with the film that he's making called Inconceivable. And we, we hear about all the crap that goes on behind the scenes that we don't normally uh, know about because we just watch the finished product. So what I highly recommend, and I will answer some of the questions here regarding where you can see it in a minute, because you can see it. Uh, I suggest you watch Becoming Iconic first. It's like 90 minutes. Very, very good film. Take a break. You know, just 
take a break for a few minutes and then watch Inconceivable. I think you, I, I think that's a great evening and it'll make so much sense. And it's almost like, to me, a director's cut because you're getting almost the commentary before the film, not with the film. That's just my own. So before I show the trailer for Inconceivable, uh, the synopsis of the storyline is you've got Angela. She develops... And you'll see this in 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 the in the trailer. She develop, develops a friendship with a mysterious woman named Katie, and offers her a job as a live-in nanny. Uh, I would offer her a job as a live-in nanny. That's most definitely. Uh, 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 but anyway, the the natural bond soon turns into a, a a dangerous obsession as Katie becomes overly attached to the family's young daughter. Enduring lies and manipulations, Angela and her husband realize that sweet Katie is actually trying to destroy their family from within. The cast in the film that Jonathan here assembled were Gina Gershon, Nicolas Cage, Nikki Whelan, Faye Dunaway, Eva Marie, and our guest doing his Tarantino and Hitchcock bit. He was in the film as well. That's that. I expect that from you and all your future films. You've always got to be in them somewhere. Um, I I want to know where people. I know that uh, that these films are available on Amazon uh, Prime. I also know that they're available on Vudu. Uh, do you know where else they're available? iTunes, iTunes, Netflix. Um, uh, the, the film can be bought DVD. So here's the deal. Uh, Becoming Iconic, you can buy now on DVD. Uh, it had a year in the film uh, markets. It went around the world, and then it had an exclusive for DVD sales. Um, and now in, um, I think it's Thanksgiving, it will be released um to all platforms and and free and pay um inconceivable can be bought on itunes amazon hulu um and it and all and 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 amazon as a d as a dvd um are they available they, do, you, they, do, do you know if they're available outside of the united states I think that they are. I mean, I know that the rights, I know that Netflix has it um, in Europe because my wife, you know, is in Sweden right now and she said that it's on Netflix there. I, I want to just capsulize what you're saying here because Becoming Iconic and Inconceivable are yin and yang to each other. It's a very unique perspective. And really the question is at the end, going through all that pressure, masterclass in directing, masterclass in understanding studio pressure and pressure cooker is inconceivable at the end of the day, good enough. Is the film worthy of anything? What you, what you failed to mention is that the topic of inconceivable is IVF. And most people that are going through IVF can probably take a stand one way or the other of what this movie is about. And, and it, it should scare you to the core it, once you've seen this movie, if you are doing IVF. And that's the magic of why I did Inconceivable, because I didn't want to do shoot 'em ups I wanted to do drama. This is what they offered me. I rewrote the script so that it could be what you see up there. And then we shot becoming iconic at the same time. And trust me, the studio was not happy. They thought I was making a reality show. I was making a documentary and I had to explain to them over and over. I don't really care about the audience or the people that are around me as I make the documentary. I only care about the initial energy of what I'm trying to teach the audience through this journey of making films. And I thought that it's invaluable and that all students, both in high school, college and film schools, should watch this film all the time as a base course in the way that they set out to be a 
filmmaker in show business. I, t I totally agree. I mean, that was something that I'd said to you in an email. That was the first thing that hit me. This is anyone that wants to be a filmmaker and any film school should show it. I did not mention that because I, I didn't, I, I was a bit hesitant. I didn't want to give too much away. I'm, I'm always, cause I tend to have a habit of giving things away, you know, and then there's no point watching the film, but, but I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I want to let everyone know, and, and, and I, I want to just continue uh, what I was just saying about the availability of the film. As you know by now, my guest has been writer, producer, director, and actor, Jonathan Baker, whose two films, Becoming Iconic and Inconceivable, can now be seen on pretty much, if you type it into your search engine, it'll tell you what platform in your area it's available. Uh, but I tell you what we, what we always do on this show, uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, underneath the video, I'm giving you all of the links so you can follow the film uh, on Jonathan's website, on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, I'm also going to put the link to the Maidstone Hotel so you can book a room there. Uh, but if you want to go to my website, thesilverstonecollection.com, that's where you will see photographs of the cast. Uh, you will see a couple of photos that I put up today, and you will have direct links again from there. So it's always easy to go to thesilverstonecollection.com where you'll see it. If you've been watching this either live on Facebook or if you're watching the video on YouTube, you will notice throughout the hour and 15 minute interview, I have had our guest's name and his website, uh, bakerentertainmentgroup.com on the screen. Jonathan, um, this is better than I expected, but we only skimmed the surface. I have so much more. Would you come back? Absolutely. But in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to watch the uh, amazing, amazing trailer uh, for this incredible film called Inconceivable. And that's coming up in a second. I want you all to have a fabulous week if you're in the United States. Great holiday weekend. If you're not in the United States, just be safe. Okay. Just be safe, be healthy. Don't do anything foolish. I love you all. Let's roll the tape to um, Inconceivable's trailer. You think it's time she slept in her own bed? Mm, next week. I love you, Dad. Oh, I love you, sweetheart. You really miss having more kids, don't you? We wanted a big family. Is she yours? She's really cute. I'm Angela Morgan. Katie Wells. Who's that? That's Katie, my play date. Here it is. Nice to meet you, Dr. Morgan. Right. Let's all raise a glass. I just feel like I'm part of the family now. My mom said Katie gives her the willies. Your mother doesn't like anyone. Why don't you just move to our guest house? You could also be our part-time nanny. Angela and Brian are going to try for another kid. They're going to use a surrogate. Wait, they're going to ask me? No, me. What are you doing? They're my babies. You're sick. We won't have the family that we wanted. We're not out of options. Have you thought any of this through? What did Katie get out of it? She's very beautiful, isn't she? Hideous. The last thing I want is for her to question either one of us. How old are your girls? They look just like you. Yeah, I get that all the time. She's not your daughter. This is your job. Yeah, to raise one of your kids and carry the other. You're hiding something, and I'm gonna find out what it is. I think she may be mentally unwell, possibly dangerous. Enough! We don't know anything about this woman. You're a drug addict. I'd rather die than have my child be raised by you. You endangered the baby. Katie has grounds for keeping him now. She's trying to kill me. You're pathetic. You accuse her of murder. Stay away from me. You're gonna kill me? Kill us?